Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray that God has tremendously blessed you. I, as always, I'm excited. I'm super stoked to be back in the Word. Um, you know, we're still in our little mini-series called um, Living Victoriously in 2020 and Beyond. And I'm here's what gets me more juiced about this deal. I keep calling it a mini-series. I keep looking for the exit ramp and it doesn't show up. Every time I come back to this word, there's another new golden nugget that God puts out there in my pathway, and it's just so good. And so even as I were looking forward to our message today, he's building on all the things that he has been teaching us from since we started into the beginning of this little mini-series. And here's the key piece. Everything that he spoke to us about, everything that he continues to teach us, is dealing with us. It's not, our circumstances are not changing in any of this. What is changing in everything is us. As we understand and we appreciate what we have in our redemption and our salvation and our eternal home and all these kind of things. And when we understand how he loves us and all that, when it all comes together, he's telling you all this about himself and what you have and what he invested in you to purchase us. Right. But now he tells you there's something else. Because I live in you, because he dwells within you, because his spirit is richly there, there is an output from that that should happen in every single believer's life, whether young convert or old convert. And here is the thing. There should be a craving. There should be a continuous craving for his word. And that is the issue. Most of us can go weeks, months, years even without even having to crack the book. And there is the problem. But if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at the first verse, say amen when you have it. If not, say what on me. 1 amen. Peter amen. chapter 2, starting at the first verse. And it reads this way. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes, babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service, Father, before going to the grave, Master. We, I thank you for these that pressed their way to be a part of this experience as well. So, Father, we ask now, Lord, if you would just fill me afresh in you with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And, Father, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer and we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. And amen. This morning's sermon title is called Craving the word. Craving the word. And at the top of your outline, you will find these beautiful words to crave. And it says to crave is an intense, reoccurring, insatiable passion for something. To long for it or strongly desired with every fiber of one's being. And that's a crave, right? This is how you ought to crave the word. In that same exact manner, right? Some of us crave food so bad that we'll get up in the middle of the night, risk life and limb to go get it because of a craving. But however times have you ever got up in the middle of the night and went down and thought you, you just had to continue to read and study in God's word? Does that happen often? Okay, I'm not going to mess with y'all this morning. But I do want to welcome you once again and just simply say that God has blessed us tremendously, um, even in the midst of the challenges of our life. And so this morning, Peter is talking to the church about having a real craving for the word of God. Do you know why we should have a real craving? Because genuine godliness is always marked by a love for and a delight in God's word. Do y'all get that? Genuine godliness is always marked by a love for and a delight in God's word. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8 verse 47 he who is of God hears the words of God right and when he says the word hears here it means to obey and in that same chapter of John chapter 8 Jesus went on to say these words as well true believers keep God's word okay Paul expressed this love for and this delight in the word of God when he said these words in Romans chapter 7 verse 22 for in my inner being I delight in God's law in his inner being. He's saying, my inner man, this is what it craves. This is his delight, right? And then Paul, the, David says these things here in Psalms 19, verse 10. David says this, the word of God is more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Do you see how 
how beautifully he's describing how rich and how wonderful it is to be in God's word? How many of you feel that way? You see, it is a basic characteristic of the believer to delight in God's word. And so I got to ask you the question. The verses that I just read, do they express your heart? Is this the way you feel? Do you find your heart crying? Oh, how I love your word, God. You see, the word of God is, is it your delight? Is it more precious to you than silver? Is it more precious to you than gold? Is it more precious than, than the trips you want to take or whatever? You know what I'm saying? Is it precious to you? Because too often it's not precious. It's just something we do to check the box and say, I gave God some time. So I, wanna, I want you to think about this question, though, because it is the question that is behind the text that is before us this morning. Peter says, like a newborn baby desires milk, so you should desire the word of God. In a sense, he's echoing the cry of the psalmist that there is to be in the heart of every believer the love of the word of God. Every believer is supposed to love the word of God. Why would we love it? Any answers? Because it is what feeds us. It is where the spirit comes from. It was the spirit was the inspiration behind having it penned. And it was penned for our betterment, never for our detriment. Right? So there should be this love for, this delight in, this literal craving to know the word of God. And this is what Peter's theme in the text is all about, is knowing and loving the word of God. And having a genuine hunger, a genuine craving, a genuine desire to be in it. And so too often we open up the book, we want to read a passage and just say, well, I read my word today. Or we get our little... Uh, um, Daily devotion sent to us in our, in our email or we get the little daily bread book and we'll read through and we'll highlight and underline some things and we'll close it up. But then you move on to a thousand other things and it never crossed your mind again. See, this is the thing. Where is the hunger? Because, see, if it's something you hunger for, by the way, and you get, and here's the thing. I, when you take what you've hungered for and you've received it and you put it into practice, it's okay to hunger again. But if you hunger and you do nothing with it, then that hunger doesn't come back because you did nothing with it. You didn't share it. You didn't apply it. You didn't teach it. You didn't do anything with it. So here's the deal. Peter is telling us that our natural response because of our salvation should be a strong desire for the word of God. It should be a dominating, driving force in the life of a believer. Some, some of you can go day after day, week after week, month after month, almost year after year, and with seemingly showing no delight in, no love for, no craving to study the Word of God. Right? And that's horrible. Because we'll binge watch Netflix, we'll binge watch Disney+, Plus, we'll binge watch all these things, and it doesn't improve your life. Come on now, I'm just trying to make it real with you because, see, everybody wants to live their best life now. And they keep thinking they can get it through stuff. The sad thing is that's the world's perspective and that's what they're going to go after. But many of the people of the church look just like the world because we're chasing that best life the same way. Peter is telling the world, the church here, how to have their best life now in the midst of a hostile situation that is getting worse. It's not getting better. He's telling them how to have their best life now and everything he's pointing them to is the truth of God's word. He's never telling them that your circumstances are changing. He's telling them what's changing in the circumstances is you. And so I love it. Because see, as a result, this exhortation from Peter becomes very, very important to us. For if your answer is no this morning, here's my question then. How can we develop that craving? If you're not craving the word of God like this, if, if the answer to that question is no, then here comes my next question. Then how can we create that craving? Right? See, there, Peter gives us what I call five principles in our text from this morning to tell us how to cultivate this craving. The first principle you'll find in verse 1a, and it's called remembering our source of life. He's talking about our eternal life, by the way. The second principle is in verse 1b, and it is eliminating our sin. The third principle is in verse 2a, and it's called admitting our need. Okay, the fourth principle 
is found in verse 2b, and it is to pursue our growth. The fifth principle is found in verse 3, and it is to survey our blessings. Now, if you'll look with me to verse 1a, we'll see what Peter has to say about remembering our source of life. He says, he opens up this way in verse 1a, he simply says, therefore. Now, if y'all had my English teacher, she would tell you, if you ever saw therefore, you have to go back and figure out what therefore was for, right? And so here it is. When Peter said therefore, he was referring back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, where you find these words written. It says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and their flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. And so here's the key. He is speaking of the seed which is imperishable. Right? It is the seed by which we are born again and it gives us eternal life. And so this is the first principle that we should never forget. Peter is reminding the church that the saving power of God's word is in our lives and it is the catalyst for ongoing commitment to scripture. And somebody should say something. Because see, if, if you've truly been saved and you truly live his life within you, then there should be a hunger, there should be a desire, there should be something that's causing you to, you just can't keep walking past the Bible because you went to church Sunday and you sat on the table when you came home and then Monday through Saturday you just walk past it and never pick it up again. I see some faces. You see, this is what makes this such a, a beautiful thing because whew, in this day and age we have so much going on in our lives and we feel helpless and powerless at times with the circumstances that's happening to us. But we don't always go back to the source from which comes our help. We don't go back to the power source. We don't, we don't go back to the one who is able. Right? When we go back to him, it's because we have hit rock bottom. We're flat on our back looking straight up. Right? Why do we got to wait to get to that place to come back to God going, thank you, Lord. Let me get a little, a little nugget here. Because see, if you were reading it, and here's the other thing. I think this is one of the greater challenges is that oftentimes we pick it up and we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't, why we don't pick it back up again mm -hmm. until we feel guilty. And then we pick it up and we read some more and then we still don't understand and we put it back down. Mm -hmm. But here's what I know to be true. In this day and age, most of us carry a little computer in our pocket called our phone. Mm -hmm. And we'll Google and everything else, anything else in the world we want to know, right? But if you're questioning something about God's word, you'll spend you'll spend a thousand dollars on one of these phones, but won't spend twenty dollars on a commentary. To help you better understand. You see, if you truly crave and you truly want to know and you truly want to grow, then you're going to spend the money. They always used to say growing up in the old church, you want to know what person's heart is, look and see what their checkbook is. Check the checkbook. You'll see what their heart is. And so very rare do you find where you're spending anything on helping you grow in your walk but you're spending money on everything else that may help your flesh grow, but not your soul. Somehow we value the flesh more than we value the soul. But do you know to realize the flesh will die, the soul will live on. I would, have to, I would put my money on the soul. And so here's the thing. In our lives, it is the catalyst for ongoing commitment to scripture and so the only power this is also here's the key piece it is the only power that enables us to live the Christian life so that spirit that lives within us it is the thing that works on our will and our desire this is what it says in scripture but here's the deal if it's continually fed the truth of God's word it is always strong in you and even when your circumstances go wrong you don't do y'all get that you see I have so many different Bibles because the Bible that I normally work from they, the bindings give out. See, my Bible looks like a wreck, but my life doesn't. Do you understand that? 
The reason why my Bible looks like a wreck is because I've gone frontwards and backwards. I've wrote in it. I've colored out. I've, I've highlighted. I've done all these things because I'm going back there and it's feeding me. It's continuing. And so maybe we need to change the tabs from Genesis and Exodus and so forth and start putting in problem here and marriage here and friendship here and job there and so forth. Because that's normally what we go look for when we have these kind of issues in our life. We want to go find a situational scripture to bail us out. Because that's how we look at it. Instead of looking at it, the totality that this is a 66 book love letter that's written for you to be the basic instructions before leaving earth. How to live victoriously in this life. That's what it's about. And so when I look at the second principle here in verse 1b, he talks about eliminating our sin. Listen to this. He says, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Do y'all realize he's telling you to do this before you can even crave? He says before even mentioning craving the word of God, Peter gives the church some preliminary measures that must be taken. We must first eliminate or lay aside any and every part of our lives that could be potentially a hindrance to our desire for God's word. So if you are a person of who's speaking malice, if you are a person who is dealing with deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and so forth, guess what you don't have time for? To crave God's word because these are all consuming issues of the world. Do you realize if you start speaking the word of God to somebody that you instantly people will start to run away from you? But if you start talking about slander, envy, deceit, malice, man, you don't you have more people than you can hit with a stick. Because we're built for the negative and nobody wants to be around for the positive. It's quiet in here. It's okay. It's okay. You see, the phrase rid yourselves or laying aside simply means to strip off, to take away, to abolish, to do away with, to get rid or to remove. Somebody should say something. And it's a command, by the way. Do y'all get that? That's a command. It's not optional. The same idea is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, as we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Again, this concept is found in James chapter 1, verse 21, where it says these words. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Do y'all see a reoccurring theme here? OK, because it, it, it is interesting to know that James places the same premium that Peter does by mentioning the elimination of the bad before ever receiving the good. In both cases, it's the word of God in both cases, that which is the good. So you can't receive the good. You know, there's a lot of little memes going on out now on, on social media where you said that, uh, you can't speak evil of people and love God, too. Yeah, that's one of the latest ones I saw pop up. You can't speak evil of people and love God, too. Because there's some truth to that. Right? But you see, it's interesting to note that James and, 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 and just, just, just says the same thing as Peter. And so here's the deal. Before my knees went bad, yeah, I used to run, believe it or not. <laughs> Really? Y'all laughing? It ain't funny. But I ran track from ninth grade all the way through 12th grade. And I probably told y'all this story before. And, and, and whether I was running a short distance, like it's 100 meters today, but back in my day it was 100 yards. Okay, I'm going to keep it real. It was 100 yards. Okay, I either ran 100 or I would run the 400, right? But the thing was is this, is that I would have been an object of everyone's laughter if I showed up at the starting line with my boots on and my Levi's or my Wrangler, but more Wranglers, I'm going to keep it clean, keep it real with you. My Wranglers and my boots and my hat. I would have been the object of everybody's laughter. You might say, why? Because you don't want anything in your way when you're trying to run that doesn't help you run. And my boots and my hat and my, and my, and my Wranglers were not going to help me run faster. So you need, I need to lay those things aside. I need to put them away from me because I want my maximum ability to get, ah, make it happen, right? And so this is the point here is that Peter is making just like I need to lay aside the cowboy boots and the jeans before running the race. So you must put aside the things in your life that are going to hinder you from desiring God's word. And here's the funny thing. We know what those things are. Amen. 
Peter specifically mentions five things that can get in the way of our passion for God's word. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander. Somebody should say something. Those five things right there. He's saying that we have the ability to put them away from us if you're in Christ. But if you're in the world, they stay with you. They're part of the package. You see, it's like an actor who wears a, a, a mask, right? But let's break this down. Let's break this down. Malice carries the meaning of hatred, cruelty, and overall general wickedness. Deceit means dishonesty. It is deceiving, crafty, cunning, and misleading. Hypocrisy means two-faced or insincere, especially talking about spiritual phoniness, right? Envy carries the idea of resenting others' prosperity. Slander falls under the category of gossiping. It describes someone who is seeking to defame another's character. These are the things that he says that you got to put these things away from you. Because think about it. If these things are not found in your mouth, if they're not found in your heart, if they're not found in your mind, right, then only thing people experience from you is good things, isn't it? Only thing people hear from you about others is what? Good things, isn't it? How come? Now, see, now you're starting to see how you start to live your best life now, right? You're starting to see how you can live victoriously in 2020 and beyond because if you're not putting salt in the game or speaking down upon someone else's name, then the only thing that should be coming out of your mouth is something lifting them up. Somebody should say something. Amen. You see, by the wording used in verse 1, it is clear that this elimination is another step to craving the word. And it is a step that must be taken for the believer to fully crave God's word. Do you know we know more bad things about people we could tell folks than we do good? Come on now. We know more bad things about people than we know about good that we could tell somebody. You know, and that's the sad part. But let's go ahead. Now in verse 2a, Peter brings our attention to the third principle, admitting our need. He says this, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. And so what does a newborn baby have to do with the word of God? You might be asking this morning, right? Y'all looking at me. Y'all want to know what a newborn baby got to do with it? I see that look in your eye, your good eye. I can see it, right? <laughs> the point Peter is making is this. Just like a newborn baby earnestly craves milk, so the believers should crave God's word. You shouldn't be able to go multiple days or even a whole day. What are I going? You know, Lord, I got to get back to your word. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you see, the word crave means to an intense, reoccurring, insatiable passion for something. And oftentimes that describes everything in the world we want but him. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it real. Mm -hmm. See, it's that kind of desire that we should have toward God's word. See, so could a newborn baby go a day without milk? Mm -hmm. Could it go a week without milk? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. 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 So so the baby's greatest need in life is milk then. Right. And so the, the, the cry for milk from a newborn baby is unmistakably and it is persistent and it is unyielding and it is relentless. Right. So then here's the thing. It is that same kind of passion and hunger that we as Christians need to have for God's word. Same way. Many would like to think that he is. Uh, when he talks about newborns. See, people read these passages of scripture without understanding. Don't want to go spend 20 bucks on a commentary, maybe, or, uh, or something like that to get a better understanding, a deeper understanding. OK, let me try to clarify what Peter means when he talks about newborn babes long for the pure uh, milk of the word. Many of you would like to think that he's talking about new converts. Right. OK, others would like to think that he's talking about those who remain as spiritual babes in Christ. But here's the key. Peter is not talking about any of those. He is making an analogy in this experience. He is simply saying every believer, whether he or she is a new convert or an old convert, whether he or she is young in the faith or mature in the faith, every believer is to crave the word of God and somebody should say something. I mean, really crave it. Because it's, it's, it, it, then it makes your, your faith real. Because you continue to put it in, you continue to grow in it, you continue to learn from it. It continues to make you better. It continues to put you in the positions to be able to receive all the blessings God had intended for you to receive in this lifetime. Because too often, it ain't God's not blessing us, it's just not we're not, we're not in a position to receive it. Somebody should say something. And so, now listen to me. Peter does not say, read the word. 
Paul said that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Peter does not say study the word. Paul said that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, right? Peter does not say meditate on the word, as Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 puts it. Peter does not say teach the word, as 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 commands. Peter does not say preach the word as 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4, excuse me, verse 2 shares. Peter does not say search the word as we see illustrated by the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Peter does not even say hide the word as the psalmist does in Psalms 119, verse 11, okay? But all of those things are very, very important, right? But check this out. But there's something even more basic than that. Before you can read it, study it, meditate on it, teach it, preach it, search it or hide it, you must have to what? You must first have a craving for it. Amen. Amen. See, it's quiet in here. Okay, it's okay. Because see, this is the basic. This is the foundational pieces. And let me share something else with you. Don't ever get to the place where you think you don't need it. This is where a lot of us are. I'm good, God. I'm good. I'm 100. See, three times the Bible says man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Whenever God says something one time in the word, it's important. When God repeats it three times, do you think it's important, 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 important? OK, so we're, we never reach that point. We spend all of our life pursuing every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Is that a true statement for you? You see, the baby cries in its infancy because it wants milk. It needs nourishment. And all the, and the believers should have that same cry because every day, guess what we need? We need the nourishment of God's word in our life so we can live a better life and be more useful in his service. And oftentimes we are not useful because the flesh continues to win in the circumstances around us. And then you want folks to pray for you. Pray for me. Pray for yourself first. Study. You see, they have no appetite. And this is what gets me. So many Christians have been stuffed with junk food. They've lost their appetite without ever being nourished. They have no appetite for the pure spiritual milk of the word. We have so many weak Christians, and even worse, we have so many weak churches. Somebody should say something. Amen. See, spiritual malnourishment is rampant today because of the junk food from the pulpits. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. But it ain't just the pulpit. There's also a rejection of pure spiritual milk by the believer, and somebody needs to say something. Mm -hmm. Because, see, he says, study to show thyself approved. He doesn't always put it all on the pulpit. Right. Come on. You see, People of God, if this describes you this morning, I encourage you to get back in touch with your need. Get back in touch with your need. We desperately need the nourishment of the word of God. Somebody should say something. See, but how should I read it? That's the next question. How should I read the word? Right. It should be read like a hungry baby sucking with all of its strength to draw out the nourishment of its mother's milk. That's how it should be read. When's the last time you opened up the scripture that you went to it as if your life depended on it? Every, every, and you hung on everything that God was speaking to you. Not that often, huh? Do you, you know... I'm often asked, you know, man, I'd like to have that, the, the way you have God's word, I'd like to have it. It, it cost me something to get there. Mm -hmm. I sacrificed a lot of things to have this relationship that I'm blessed to walk in with God. And this was many years ago, and I'm fearful of losing it. Because I know if I'm not in it, on the regular, it's easy for something else to take its place. And the other part of it is, is that what I've learned in this word and what he's revealed to me, if I'm not using it and putting it into practice, it's just as well as I'm not doing anything at all with it. It's done. It's going to go away. It's like learning a foreign language and being fluent in it and never speaking it. And all of a sudden, somebody who speaks that language that you've learned comes to you and you can't say nothing but hi. <laughs> because you never put it into practice. See, training 
isn't training until it's actually utilized. So the time you get trained, you got education. Education becomes training when it's put into practice. Somebody should say something. It's the same thing about the truth of God's word. When it's put into you, it's a knowledge of base of what's inside of you. But when it's flowed through you into action, now it is a lifestyle. Y'all watch out. Because you see, it is always sad to see a human being who is malnourished, weak, and stunted in development. Right? When they want you to give to the Feed the Children campaign, they don't put the healthy kids up there. They put the ones that are sickly, right? Because it draws on your heartstrings, right? So it's horrible. It's hard to see that and sit there and you be sitting there with a big burger in your mouth. Right? But here's something even sadder. Seeing believers who are spiritually malnourished and underdeveloped. That's even sadder. Because it is by the intake of the truth and, the, and that Holy Spirit that grows and matures a believer. But if you're not doing an intake of the truth, you don't grow. You stay malnourished. You stay underdeveloped. You stay beaten down by your circumstances. Somebody should say something. But y'all realize that it's not an option if we grow. It's a commandment that we grow. But here he tells us specifically what to grow in. He says, grow into your salvation. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18 says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says specifically what you are to grow into. Most of us want to grow into a new clothing outline. See, Peter tells us. It will grow us in respect to salvation. In other words, it will grow us into the fullness of the expression of our salvation. Somebody needs to say something. You see, it will grow us literally into salvation, into his fullest, full, final, glorious expression. And I must share this with you. If you are content with where you are spiritually, you will never grow. If you're okay, cool with how you are in your personal walk with God right now, you will never grow any further than where you are now. If anything, you're going to regress and go backwards. But if you're discontent, you will grow. See, our spiritual growth rises out of discontent. Did y'all get that? Our spiritual growth rises out of Discontent. See, this is a very important principle. Spiritual growth rather than discontent. We are never to be satisfied with where we are spiritually. See, check this out. Listen to what the greatest Christian that has ever lived said. The Apostle Paul writes these words in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. He says this, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody should say something. Paul says, I did not get it. I'm not, I have not arrived, but I'm pressing on in the upward call. See, he's always going up. He's never coming down. Amen. <sighs> so let's close this. So pursue your growth. Don't ever become content. As believers, we should be motivated by the opportunity to grow strong and mature in Christ and to enjoy greater blessings. Do you know when you grow stronger and mature in Christ, you enjoy greater blessings because you're in a position to receive and maintain the blessings God is willing to pour out on you? But also, here's the other piece of that deal. Is that you also become more useful. You will become more useful. God will send you in some pathways of some people and you will walk with them and you will be a shining light and you will put nuggets and seeds and plant them into a soil and helping them till it up and get all the things out of it that's not right. And they'll start to take root and then their life will change and it becomes a living legacy. But let's get out. In verse three, Peter now reveals the fifth principle to craving God's word, and it is surveying our blessings. Listen to how he says it. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Do y'all get that? He's saying so survey your blessings. You've tasted God. You've tasted his power. You've tasted his deliverance. You've tasted 
tasted his salvation. You've tasted his protection. You've tasted his healing. You've tasted his comfort. You've, you've tasted his protection. He's saying you've already sampled all these things. And you know that it is good. Survey your blessings is what he's telling you. So right now, finally, Peter reminds the church of something that they already know to be true. Namely, that their, their personal experience of God's kindness. Instead of God giving us what we deserved, he gave us grace. Instead of he gave us what we needed, he, he gave us what we needed. So that becomes key. The word tasted could just as easily be translated as experienced. And the word now could just as easily be translated as sense. And so you would read it as this. Since you've experienced God and you know that he's good. Right? See, that's the same idea found in Psalms 38 verse 8 where it says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, taste and see. Peter's point is that we have all experienced or tasted the kindness of God. If nowhere else, we've all experienced his graciousness at salvation. Therefore, we should move, desire more of what of that goodness that continue to feed on his word. We should desire more of it. We should regularly survey the blessings of our salvation. Do y'all get that? Regularly survey the blessings? See, oftentimes we regularly survey the possessions we have. Mm. You know, I got some Louis and Deweys and some Gucci's and some, mm. right? We survey the, the, the items, but we don't survey the blessings. <sighs> Remembering the many times that God has answered our prayers. Come on now. Mm -hmm. Huh? And all the times that he has touched our lives with kindness and mercy when we deserve justice, which would have meant death for us. So as we close, I got to ask you this. Do you really want that craving? And if you do, then put this message into practice in your life daily. Put it into practice in your life daily. And you will live not only victoriously in 2020, but also in beyond. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another beautiful day. I thank you for this time and this opportunity to stand and be used in your service, Master. I pray, Father, what, that all that was shared here this morning was accepted on thy sight. God, I thank you and just love you. I pray also as we get ready to go forward in this week, Lord, that you would continue to go before us. Lead us and guide us. Keep us in perfect peace until we should come together again. And Lord, I also I want to remember the Hawker family right now, Lord, as they prepare to celebrate in Paul Hawker's life. Um, I also want to remember the uh, Lenine Dinsley and Paul Dinsley and family and so forth as they prepare to celebrate his life as well. God, we just thank you for just being who you are, being our great comforter and our, and our father. And Master, we just ask these blessings in your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. Love you guys. Have an excellent week. Take care.